All right, so what we're going to do through intermediate discipleship is that we're going to go through apologetics. So we're going to cover some things where we defend our Christian belief. I also believe that covering this will also help us motivate to grow ourselves even more. So that's why I'm going to start out with this. All right, so we start out with the foundation of the King James Bible and dispensationalism, which is absolutely essential. So those are the two main foundations, which is why we know that our type of church is the right church. So that's important to understand. Now you got to defend your beliefs against all these cults. So we're going to cover the Catholic Church today. So let's cover Matthew chapter 1, verse 24, please. So let's cover the first issue here. The first issue is that Mary is a perpetual, sinless virgin. Mary is a perpetual, sinless virgin. That's what the Catholic Church teaches. So that's the first issue. And how we're going to debunk this is by using Scripture, obviously. So we're going to use, the first one will be Matthew chapter 1, verses 24 through 25. Matthew chapter 1, verses 24 through 25. So notice right here from the scriptures that we see that Mary, when she was a virgin, it was until, it was until she brought forth her firstborn Jesus. So after Jesus was born, that's when we believe that her virginity stopped. So yes, she was a virgin when Jesus was born, but it was until after she gave birth to Jesus. That's concerning her virginity. The Bible says here, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till what? See, so notice right here, Joseph did not have sexual relationship with Mary, but not forever. The Bible specifically says, Until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So you'll notice right here what's important to understand is that this is debunked because Mary, she did have sexual relationships. Excuse me. It shows right here Mary did have a sexual relationship. Another thing right here is that we're going to turn to the book of Matthew chapter 13, please. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. All right, now this one you want to write down. This one is Catechism 966. So you want to prove this with Catechism Doctrine. Because Catholics, what's important to understand is that they all differ in beliefs. That is important to understand. These Catholics are very differentiated in beliefs. That's why they can keep growing. Because they're not indoctrinated properly. So when you tell them what's wrong with their Catholic belief system, they're going to deny it. So when they deny it, you need to pull up their catechism to prove to them that this is what their Catholic Church states. Now, you can find this online, okay? Just type down catechism online and you should find something. So I, uh, I found catechism statements from the Vatican's official website, actually. So this one is found at Catechism 966. So they teach this according to Catechism 966. So you want to make sure that you... Mark that down when you deal with them. Here's a quote. Finally, the Immaculate Virgin, preserved free from all stain of original sin, when the course of her earthly life was finished, was, taking, was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory, and exalted by the Lord as queen over all things, so that she might be the more fully conformed to her Son, the Lord of lords and conqueror of sin and death. The Assumption of the Blessed Virgin is a singular participation in her son's resurrection and an anticipation of the resurrection of other Christians. So notice right here, it says that the Immaculate Virgin preserved free from all stain of original sin. So that's important to understand. Okay, now the Catholics, they might argue this way. The verse could be just saying that Mary did not have sexual relations when Jesus was born. It does not really say she did not have sexual relations after his birth. So that's what some Catholic apologists might argue. They might argue that, well, the Virgin Mary 
she did not have sexual relations only when, uh, it's only just giving a statement, just a matter of fact statement that she did not have sex when Jesus was born. It wasn't saying that she did not have sex at all. That's what they're gonna be pointing out. So what you wanna do, so you write these verses down. So you already turned to Matthew 13, keep, keep it there, but you wanna debunk the argument with these. So write these verses down. Several examples include Genesis 35, 23. The other one is 36, 15. And the other one is 1 Chronicles 2, 13, and 3, 15. So if you look at all of these passages, here's the key. If you remember back at Matthew chapter 1, verse 24 through 25, Notice the verse said that she, uh, he knew her not until she brought forth her what? Firstborn is the key here. What does that mean? That means there were other people born. Jesus was the first. Well, then where did all those kids came from? I guess Mary was a virgin and she kept giving miracle births after Jesus. So they're not going to go for that. So if you look at these verses, you're going to find out that firstborn in all these verses show that there were other children born after them and there was obviously sex involved. So Mary, she did have a sexual relationship. Okay, another thing is Matthew chapter 13, right? So let's look at that one, Matthew chapter 13. And then we'll read verses 55 through 57. Matthew chapter 13, verses 55 through 57. Now, in this passage, what we're going to prove right here is that Mary, she did have... <clears throat> several children, not just Jesus. So the Catholics, they don't like that argument. So you can use this passage to prove that Mary, she had several children. Well, where did they come from then, huh? So in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55 through 57, and then a second verse, which you can eventually turn to, if you want, if you want, is Mark chapter 6, verses 3 through 4. Mark chapter 6, verses 3 through 4. Okay, so let's look at these passages here. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, Is not this a carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Wow, you really think she's a virgin after that? <laughs> Notice all these brothers and sisters mentioned in the verse right here. So notice right here that Mary, she was not a perpetual virgin. Another thing is you'll notice at verse Mark chapter 6, verses 3 through 4 here. I'll just read it. Is not this a carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. Now, the Catholic Church, they don't like this argument, because it shows that Jesus had brothers and sisters. So how they debunk this argument is that some Catholic apologists are going to argue, well, that's only referring to his cousins. <laughs> well, did the verse say cousins or brothers and sisters? Yeah, brothers and sisters, but they're going to insist that this is only referring to cousins. So how are you going to debunk this? How you're going to debunk this is you're going to turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 36. Turn to Luke chapter 1, and then we'll read verse 36. Okay, so then notice that Mary, she had a cousin. I guess that word cousin meant her best friend, right? That's what it means. Or her grandma, maybe. That's what it means. See what they're doing? Why am I being very ludicrous here? I'm being very ludicrous because you can take any word in the Bible and just put your own wording in there. That's what they're doing with brother and sister. Oh, cousin. Well, why don't you just say best friend then, huh? Why don't you say some same-sex partner or something ridiculous, man? You can put any kind of thing you want over there. Okay, so let's look at Luke chapter 1, and then we'll read verse 36. Notice right here that Mary, she had a cousin. So when the Bible says brother, it means brother. When the Bible says sister, sister, cousin is what? A cousin. 
The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verse 36, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. So notice right here that cousin is cousin. Not only that, what you got to understand is that why did Jesus said his mother had more children? When you look at, look at this one, go to John, John chapter 2. So here's another one you can use, John chapter 2. And then we're going to look at John chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. Now, when you have John 2, 16 through 17, you're going to compare that with the book of Psalms. Psalm 69, verses 8 through 9. Now, these two are double whammies here. Jesus is going to point out, even Jesus himself is going to point out right here, unless you want to say the scriptures are broken, the scriptures are lying, that's the only way you can do it. But Jesus himself and the scriptures state that Jesus had siblings. The mother had children, other children, not just Jesus. All right, John chapter 2, and then we'll read verse 16. The Bible says right here, And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written. So it's a prophecy of Psalms, which we're going to turn to. The zeal of, th of thine house hath eaten me up. Okay, so it's a prophecy of Jesus cleansing the temple. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up at the book of Psalms. It's talking about Jesus, right? Cleaning the temple. Now, look at Psalm 69. Hmm, look at Psalms chapter 69. And then we'll read verses 8 through 9. Look at this. You're going to know, let's start off with verse 9. You'll notice that verse 9, that is a prophecy of John 2, 16 through 17 describing Jesus. Verse 9, For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Right? Look behind verse 9. Jesus, right? I am become a stranger unto my what? Brethren. Oh, it's just talking about his uh, countrymen. No, and an alien unto my what? Mother's children. Oops, what are you going to do with that? See, Mary did not just have one child, Jesus, and she was a virgin forever. She had other children. That's utmost proof. Now, what they're going to do is that some Catholic apologists are pretty clever, actually. So what they're going to argue is that they can also argue the fact that the Bible shows sister and brother can refer to relatives or close relationship. And they're going to pull these verses. Okay, so let's look at some of their counter arguments here. So one of the ways that the Catholics will counter-argue is that sister and brother truly does, and it can refer to relatives or close relationship. Now, turn to the book of Genesis 24. Genesis 24. So it's just a close kin. It's not referring to a literal brother and sister. They're going to use Genesis 24, verse 60 as one example. Several more verses which are not important because we'd, uh, we can just admit that they're right on these verses. Other verses would fail to include Judges 9.3 and James 2.15. Judges 9.3 and James 2.15. Again, we don't have to worry about those verses because we'll take it for granted that those verses are right. So look at Genesis chapter 24 <clears throat> and then we'll read verse 60. Notice the Bible says, And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our what? Sister. Notice that Rebekah has her parents, her own parents, calling her sister. So notice right here that sometimes brother and sister does not literally mean brother and sister. It just means like a close relationship, someone related to the family. So some smart Catholic apologists might pull up this argument on you. They might pull up this argument on you. Okay, so we're going to turn to some answers to debunk this notion. What you can argue is that it is nonsensical. You can argue that way. Why is that? Because what every word that has <clears throat> brother and sister, what will it do? True, it can sometimes refer to close kin, but what does majority hold? 
for sister and brother. Majority holds for sister and brother is literal. Majority of the time. You can't just pick like a minuscule amount of verses and say, and prove, well, that's what it means, close kin. No, you got the majority of verses that prove that, no, it is a literal brother and sister. But the more important thing is the context here. Because let's return to Matthew chapter 13, huh? Matthew chapter 13. Now remember these two passages, Matthew 13, Mark 6. So those two passages are going to debunk it. But let's look at just one of them. Matthew chapter 13. And then we'll read verses 55 through 57. Matthew chapter 13. And then we'll read verses 55 through 57. Notice that the Bible says right here, verse 55, talking about carpenter's son, mother called Mary his brethren, right? Verse 56, his sisters, right? Now look at verse 57, what Jesus said. A uh, and they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country, and what? In his own house. So he's talking about his own household here. He's talking about his own household. So that's utmost proof. But you also got these two passages, right? John 2, Psalm 69. What are they going to do with this one, huh? Says his mother's children. But not only that, let's be more honest. If we look at context honestly, at verse 55, 56, it mentions Carpenter's son. That's his house. Mother Mary, his house. And then all of a sudden, brethren, you're going to switch that to what? His countrymen? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. So context shows this is talking about his own household here. Now let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 46. Oh, this one they don't like. There's a Catholic lawyer named Carl Keating. And surprisingly, I didn't know that he's still popular for Catholic apologists. But actually, uh, he's, I was very surprised. He's not that good of a debater. Dr. Altman just mopped the floor with him, and man, they, what, three, four, four, five hours long, the whole debate? And Dr. Altman, he let him have the first word, and Dr. Altman let him have the last word, too. Dr. Altman, when he finished the debate, he was like saying, I enjoyed myself today, and then the people were like going, hey, man, you know, like that. But he did a terrible job. He was sweating the whole time, but there was a pastor, and he's still faithfully pastoring. He's one of the reasons, so I guess I'm giving a shout-out to the pastor. So he's one of the reasons why I never quit the ministry. Small pastor, small, uh, small church, but he never quit. Faithful for probably 30 years, maybe even longer. Pastor Steve Andrus at San Pedro, and that pastor, he asked uh, Keating. I could be wrong about this, so if somebody's watching online from the San Pedro church and they hear this, they can double-check with the pastor. But he asked Carl Keating up front, uh, what do you think about this passage? And it's this passage right here. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 1, verse 46 through 47. Now we're going to look at this case right here concerning about Mary. And Keating, you know what he did? He went like this with his answer. You should see that, yeah, in the Q&A part. It, and then he, you can tell he was deliberately trying to buy time. And then he said, I don't have much time to answer this question. He kept using that as an excuse. And then when the alarm clock ring, uh -huh. bing, you know how Keaton went? He just looked at him and went like this. And then uh, so, some of the brothers who were with me watching that said, whoa, wicked, like that. <laughs> so let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 46 through 47. All right. And Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my what? Savior. Okay, why would she, why would Mary need a Savior if, she seen, if she's sinless? Ouch. Because she needs someone to save her from her sins. Now, this is another passage you can use. Luke chapter 2. Now, this is the one Pastor Andrus used. It's this one, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verse 21 through 24. Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. Now, I did not hear a satisfying answer to this one right here, because this one's pretty plain. Luke chapter 2, verse 21 through 24. 
And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer. Okay, so what did Mary have to do with the sacrifice with her son, Jesus? Offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, right? Yep. So, okay, so let's keep in mind here. One, Mary had to offer a sacrifice. <clears throat> the sacrifice, notice right here, is two young uh, turtle doves or pigeons. Now, we're also going to see what this passage is explaining at Leviticus 12. Go to Leviticus 12. Leviticus chapter 12. Well, what's so important about that, Pastor? Because she was offering a sin offering, specifically for her sins. Look at Leviticus chapter 12. Leviticus chapter 12. And then we'll look at verses 1 through 3. Leviticus 12, verses 1 through 3. And then verse 8. Leviticus chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And then verse 8. Okay, so I think they can read that. Yeah, so I'm going to have to stop about over here. All right, so let's look at this passage. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Notice, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a man-child. So notice that this is referring to the same passage about Mary. Because remember, Mary at Luke chapter 2, she gave birth to a man-child. Keep reading. Then shall she be unclean seven days, according to the days of the separation for her infirmity. Infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Now, notice that this perfectly matches with Luke chapter 2, verse 21 through 24. Remember, Jesus had to be circumcised the eighth day, right? At Luke chapter 2. Okay, so this is undoubtedly the same passage referring to the sacrifice. Now look at verse 8. And if she shall not be able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons. That perfectly matches Luke chapter 2. So that is what she's following. Okay, now keep reading. The one for a burnt offering, one, and the other for a what? Sin offering. And the what? Priest shall make an atonement for her. Oh, so Mary could even do the intercession right here. She had to have some regular priest do that for her. Wow, isn't that amazing? Isn't that weird? Very weird, man. So notice right here that I guess, Mary, you're just wasting your time with her, seeking her forgiveness for sins and interceding on your behalf. Amen. If she had to seek a human to do that herself. How about that? All right. Uh, another one is Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Now, there is one thing I want you to keep in mind here. Catechism, we're going to keep it right here at 966. In Catechism 966, you'll notice that they believed in exalting Mary, right? So we talked, uh, so it mentioned about exalting Mary. So I'll leave that up right there. I'll just erase this top part here. Have, have you ever heard the excuse, we don't worship Mary, we just honor her? How many times are you sick and tired of hearing that, right? And then you're like, no, you are worshiping her. You're, if you're being honest, you're not exalting her, you're worshiping her, okay? It's just so weird. Now, their Catechism 966 demands that she be exalted, see? So if you remember me reading that quote, then you'll me remember me mentioning about her being exalted. Now, what does the Bible say about that? Let's look at Acts chapter 1, and then we'll read verse 14. Should we exalt Mary? Should Mary be exalted? Mm. Now, here's what you can get on them, okay? Now, do we believe, now, Bible-believing Christians, we do believe, don't get us wrong, we thank God for Mary, what she did. I mean, what a high honor, amen, to give birth to the Son of God. She, uh, she must have been a very good woman. But unfortunately, now they turn it into a deified, Semiramis, pagan, Babylonian, Ishtar, goddess, and I'm sure a lot of you didn't like hearing that. 
but that is the truth if you're going to be honest. Amen. Okay, but just scratch everything I just said, okay? Pretend it was all mean on my part, okay? And forgive me. So what we're going to do now is just look at the scriptures here. If Mary was such an important figure in the church, I want you to ask you this. I want you to ask yourself this question. This is a good argument to use on them when they try to make an excuse. Well, you guys don't honor Mary, but we do. You ever? They're going to pull that line on you. We don't worship her, but we honor her. We exalt her. Isn't it alarming then if she's such an important figure in the church that the early church didn't think she was that important? She was only mentioned one time in the beginning of the early church, if that's when your Catholic church started. And the primary attention was to Peter for the first growth of the church and Paul for the most chapters and the rest of the books of the Bible. So aren't they... And then, so here's my question then. So this is how you can catch them. If Mary should be exalted, oh, yikes, okay. If Mary should be exalted, then why is it that she's exalted more than Peter and Paul? You notice that in the Catholic Church? But Peter and Paul are more mentioned and more important in the early church. And she's only mentioned one time in the mention of the early church. That's how you catch them. That's how you prove to them there's something wrong right here, what you're doing with Mary then. Hmm. That shows that they're doing something more than this. Because the Bible didn't exalt her. She was more debased than Peter and Paul. Ooh. So let's look at Acts chapter 1, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. That's it. And then bye-bye Mary. Everything was Peter after that. And after that, it was Paul. Paul, 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 and Paul, and Paul. Hmm. So shouldn't the Catholics then pay attention to Paul's writing and exalt his writings, especially writings about faith not by works, and stop jumping to apocryphal writings and then other writings? Hmm, isn't that strange and weird? So actually, oh, you guys aren't doing any exalting. Well, actually, no, we honor uh, Paul more highly than Mary here, and we do some kind of honoring, and we honor his writings more. So why don't you Catholics do that? Because that's the biblical way of doing things. Hmm, okay. Let's also look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy, and then we'll look at chapter 2. Now, again, we can understand about being grateful to Mary, amen. amen. But the way Catholics exalt her is way too much. Yeah, amen. Now, if they don't think so, no, oh, we don't exalt her that much, then this is how you can catch them too. Why do they raise her in a higher, why do they raise her in a higher position of God's ministry above Peter, Paul, and the apostles? when the Bible says that she is supposed to be in a lower position in the ministry. That's, right. That's how you can debunk this Mary exaltation, That's right. is 1 Timothy 2. That's how you get them. She is not supposed to be exalted in the ministry, actually. She's supposed to be lowered. Look at this, okay? This anti-feminism passage right here. Just look at this. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Poor Mary. Poor Mary. She didn't get any attention at all. Uh, 1 Timothy 2. Mm -hmm. And then look at verse 12. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the what? Man. Oh, why was she in authority over then? Peter and Paul. See, that's how you can get them on the exaltation of Mary. So when you try to get on them that how much they worship her, they're going to say, oh, no, we don't worship her. We just honor her. Then you get them on. No, you're not supposed to even honor her that much. In the ministry, you're not supposed to do that. All right, let's look at Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. One last thing concerning this one, this Catholic dogma right here. Jeremiah chapter 7. Now, according to Catechism 966, what did they call her? They called her the queen of all things, right? So if you might remember me reading off of that, they called her the queen of all things. Now, this is where you can catch them that they're worshiping a wrong type of Mary here. How you can get them is this, is that the reason why 
I'm going to say this in all love, okay? Not, a, not with sarcasm, okay? And I hope that if there's a Catholic watching, they would take me this seriously. The reason why you Catholics exalt Mary more than the real Mary in the Bible is because you are actually worshiping a pagan goddess, the Queen of Heaven. Yeah. Because look at Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 18. The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the what? Queen of Heaven. Don't the Catholics always lay out these little cakes right in front of the Virgin Mary? Yeah. Where did they get that from? Hmm. What spirit, if that is, okay, so let's be honest here. If this is not the Holy Spirit within that, then what other spirit would lead those people to do that if not the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Now look at Jeremiah 44. Jeremiah 44, verse 17. Jeremiah chapter 44, and then we'll read verse 17. Okay, so we see right here that Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 18, and then chapter 44, verse 17 through 25, that what the Catholics worship, they call her the queen of all things, queen of heaven, but the Bible says this queen of heaven is what? Is not of the Bible. It is of the devil. It is of the devil. And I'm saying that with sincerity and care. And that, why? Because I'm just simply reading you what the verse says. 1 Timothy chapter 2. It debunked the idea of any exaltation concerning Mary in the ministry. And then right here with Peter and Paul, we notice that at Acts chapter 1 verse 14... That these people were more emphasized than the Virgin Mary. So there's something. So then you got to ask the Catholics this question. Then where do you get. So let's be honest here. So then we can see from the beginning of the Bible. This is not how Christians practice then. So then where did you get this idea from? They got it from somewhere. Where else if not this one right here. Because they've been doing this for a long time. Hmm. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 44, we'll read verse 17. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. So drink offerings, this perfectly just imitates Catholic mass. Yeah. It just makes you, I don't have to pull up historical documentations, just from scripture alone. Cakes, drink offerings, queen of heaven, I mean, what in the world? Incense. This is, this is totally paganism, according to the book of Jeremiah alone. Let's keep reading. We and our fathers, our king and our princes, see? Because that's what our culture does, right? Yeah. That's Catholics. That's what our culture does. Our family did that. Our government leaders did that. Hmm. In the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, for then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to bore out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. And when we burn incense to the queen of heaven, and then you can read down all the way to the end of verse 25. So that's what it is. The Bible calls it abominations. If you keep reading verse 17 through 25, abominations. Now, then, if the Bible calls this title abomination, then this Catholic dogma, is it not what? Let's be honest. It's abominable. Yeah. You might as well throw it in the garbage. Amen. Take your catechism and throw it in the garbage. And if, that, if you think that I just blasphemed the Holy Ghost and then just disgraced your blessed virgin, let me tell you something. I do not apologize disgracing to... That is not the real genuine Mary right. that I'm disgracing right here. She's a great woman, and she's a woman that was filled with humility in the Bible, not Amen. exaltation. That's, right. That's why she's one of the prime examples for women today. That's, right. That's how we respect her. You disgrace her by putting her in an exalted position and that you connect her to this pagan, deified witch. That's, right. That's what you did. Amen. Okay, so now let's look... <clears throat> At Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Now, churches keep messing up in arguing this passage. 
They'll use Greek, Hebrew to try to define to you what this rock is. And then it just, pastors keep messing up this interpretation. So uh, Bible believers are going to have the advantage. So I want you to remember this argument. This is going to be very useful for you. You don't want to be like those typical Protestants who keep quoting Greek, Hebrew, and then don't give a convincing argument for Matthew 16. Matthew 16 is a pretty strong argument for the Catholic Church. Matthew 16, 18 through 19. So basically, what do I mean by the rock here? So basically, they teach that the rock, the church is built upon the rock. So the foundation of the church is the rock. And that rock is Jesus Christ, amen. Nope, not to the Catholic Church. It's Peter. Why do they want to say that? Because they want to say that Peter was the first pope. So thus, the foundation of the church, our rock, should be on the pope. That's why they believe that you should listen to what the pope says. That's what they say. So look at Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 through 19. Now, as we look at this passage, I'm going to quote to you the catechism. So this one you want to write down to prove to them. So this is what they teach. Catechism 881 to 882. Catechism 881 to 882. So that's their catechism here. So remember this, I am not giving my own biased opinion here. I am giving from the official Catholic dogma. If there's a Catholic who says, no, we don't teach that, we don't proclaim that, then you point out to them, they don't even understand their own catechism. Yeah, so this is important because Catholics, they all contradict in beliefs. Yeah. You got to remember that. So it's best that you pull this up so you can point out to them. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I say also unto thee, so Jesus is speaking to Peter, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, see it seems like Jesus is pointing to Peter, you are the rock, that I will build my church. See, that's, this seems to support the Catholic argument. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Wow, what power. So Peter can bind and loose up in heaven and here on earth. Seems like that the Pope has that power. That's why it makes so much sense in the dark ages. They feared their popes. They feared that they would lose their soul to the devil. So they followed the, so that's why the popes, they had this abusive power where they lived off with illegitimate children running around. And they had whores in the, in the Vatican. I'm, I kid you not. This is a historical fact in the Dark Ages. They, had, they were going bankrupt. They had so much money. Yeah. This is wickedness, pure utter wickedness. Yeah. Okay, now what we believe is this, is that this rock, according to the original Hebrew, is referring to Jesus Christ. And No, no, no. Stop talking like Judas White and then, you know, trying to pretend that you know so much when you don't. So, the rock is referring to Jesus because we're going to use the scriptures to show that it is Jesus, not pick and choose definitions from Latin, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. The Catholics love the Aramaic for this one to prove that it's referring to Peter. Whatever, okay? We're going to use the Bible. Amen. Okay, so let's use the Bible right here. So, we're, what we believe is this. Jesus says, thou art Peter upon this rock. I will build my church. Now, that's just interpretation, though. So we can argue it could be this way, or Jesus could be saying, Thou art Peter, you're the rock I will build. So how do we know which interpretation is right? Sola Scriptura. Okay, so John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And then we'll read verse 19. John chapter 2. And then we'll read verse 19 through 21. Did Jesus do that before? You got to understand this. When Jesus said, okay, now this is important to understand. Jesus said this rock, right? Is that what Jesus said? He said this rock upon this rock. Now, is it true that Jesus sometime before went this rock referring to himself rather than something out there? So the Catholics, they're assuming 
when Jesus said, this something, this rock, Jesus was pointing to something else out there, not to himself. But guess who made the same misunderstanding? The Pharisees and Sadducees. Because look at this one. John chapter 2, and then we'll read verse 19. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But look how these good old Catholics thought at verse 20. Then said the Jews, forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? Ah, Jesus was not referring to, he wasn't going like this, destroy this temple. He wasn't doing that. He was going to destroy this temple. Yeah. Because keep reading here. Verse 21, but he spake of the temple of his what? Body. 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 Wow. Now, here's the thing, is that how you can also get on the Catholics right here is that, now give me one verse in your entire Bible where Jesus was referring Peter as the rock. There is none. So that's why our interpretation will stand. Why? Because let's see what Peter himself thought. Do you think Peter said, I'm the rock when Jesus went like this? No, Peter knew that Jesus went like this. Yeah. This rock. Yeah. Peter knew that. Because look at Peter himself. I mean, look, I, he's your pope. Okay, Peter is your pope. Why don't you listen to what he says? Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2. And then let's close it here. 1 Peter 2. And then uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 4 is way more clear. So we won't turn there for time's sake. But write down 1 Corinthians 10, 4. You want to write that too. Paul himself, that Christ was the rock. Paul himself. He made it very clear. But I want to look at Peter, your precious pope, what he thought about the rock. Okay, look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Ye also have lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Okay, let's see what Jesus Christ has talked about here. Six, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief what? Cornerstone. Cornerstone. Look at verse seven. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone, see that, is made the what? head of the corner. He's the head of the church. That's what Peter thought. He's the head, not the Pope. Now look at verse 8. And a stone of stumbling and a what? Rock of offense. So now we know what Peter thought. Peter did not thought of himself as the rock. He knew it was definitely referring to Jesus Christ. Okay, so we're going to have to uh, close it right here. We will debunk issue number two later on in our Catholic apologetics. All right, now, your homework assignment. Now, this might be kind of strange to you, but this is going to be very important. So what I'm kind of feeling bad about is in intermediate discipleship, I keep making you guys buy books. <laughs> so this one, <clears throat> because I'm going to give lessons on this, I guess you don't have to buy this, but what I would recommend, so this is just suggested. Suggested material is to please tried to buy Y.T. Wee's book, okay? So I'm going to write it. Y, literally Y and T and we. It's called The Soul Winner's Handy Guide. Please buy that one. That one is awesome in covering all sorts of apologetics. Another recommended reading material is by James Melton. And this one is super cheap. You can get it, okay? You can get this. This is super cheap. It's a pamphlet. Handbook of Heresies. Handbook of Heresies. I think you could read it online possibly too. So at his website. So his website, just type down, uh, I forgot his website exact name, but just type down James Melton and Handbook of Heresies. And the Bible Baptist Publications. So Bible Baptist Publications. Bible Baptist Publications. If you go over there, you'll find this. this. These two are awesome because they cover from evolution, Jehovah Witness arguments, Catholic arguments, and YT Wee's includes soul winner tips. So this is even better, YT Wee's book. So these two I highly recommend. They cover all sorts of heresies. And then Melton's book just makes it so easy because it goes in alphabetical order. So all you have to do is look up a religion name and then he'll guide you. Mm -hmm. Sir, it's uh, BibleBaptistPublications.org. 
BibleBaptistPublications.org. Okay, BibleBaptistPublications.org. So those are recommended reading material. Okay, your homework assignment, I will uh, post it later on at the end of this video. Heavenly Father, I pray that today's discipleship have increased our hunger and our confidence in what we believe is truth, especially as we cover and debunk more religions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone, without works, through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you. Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount? A passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application. King James onlyism is double standards. Now there's a false doctrine out there called dispensationalism. Yeah, I, I don't believe one saved always saved. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak 
a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. <laughs> but you don't want to get identified with the reproach of what really believing this Bible is all about. You know what these wicked left-wing liberal perverts want you to do? Legalizing the marijuana or homosexuality or if the whole entire world turns against the Lord. Is that person saved? Is that person on their way to heaven or hell? The common person has no thought of God in their mind. That people will leave the church over the color of the carpet. What's wrong with our churches? Why don't we have a closer walk with Jesus? Why isn't everybody running around like little Jesus is shouting and screaming and hollering? That thing you look in the mirror, it don't want to go street preaching. It don't want to read the Bible. It don't want to pray. It wants to watch TV and a bunch of other junk. A lot of you don't have it because you're lazy. That's why you don't have it. Because you won't work. That's why. Don't you know the Bible says, Whoa! Unto the wicked! I'll tell you, Jesus Christ loved you enough. He came down here to put up with your dirty ways. The wages of sin is death. When you offer somebody a gospel track, if uh, you're walking away and you see them throw it on the ground, that's not because they're afraid of what's in it. They know what's in it. No matter where you are today, turn to God and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God Almighty got me through and got me through for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 35 years, 40 years. You mess with that book, honey, I'll mess with you. Shame on you, you don't read the Bible. Shame on you, you don't the Bible. Shame on you, if you don't witness with Jesus Christ. Shame on you. I like to whip that smile out of you. Sister Beck, our song, just the fact that we're in Christ will never see hell is enough to shout about it. Give me your power, Lord. You know what we need? We need people to fall on their knees. We need people to pray to the Lord, raise the King James Bible high, believe in this sensational truth, and Lord, I just don't want their power. I pray like Elisha, double the portion, Lord. Fill it within me. Fill it within me, the filling power of your spirit. Give me your power, Lord. Give me your power. Give me your power. And God, the Holy Spirit, will move upon this church and fill within him his Holy Spirit power. Amen. Then we'll see soul saved. Then we'll see God do something with this truth. Then we'll see the liberals and the homosexuals getting a thing. Then we'll see those apostate Christians getting mad. Then we'll see all the world opening their eyes to the truth and they say, yeah, uh, we have not seen such a thing. Brother, sister, there's only one hope. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the man God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.